All right, so it is three o'clock. Uh, welcome. Welcome everybody for joining uh, our virtual program today. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Nobel Prize. As Brittany is mentioning in the chat box, and by the way, we are going to open up the webinar chat box uh, during this entire program. And uh, we did allow everybody to be chatting with everybody else. So really what I'm hoping for is that while I'm presenting this program, we're just going to be, you know, kind of the background noise, you know, where the TV that you have turned on uh, in the living room. Uh, and in the meanwhile, if you guys want to discuss with each other about literature, about the prize, about your favorite authors in general, definitely feel free to do so. Uh, and if I happen to take a glance at the chat box uh, in between slides, uh, then I'll, I'll join in with a few comments and thoughts on that as well. So really, uh, even though this is a presentation, a virtual presentation, you know, sometimes it can feel like it's more of a, you know, one directional lecture. Uh, but I really hope that everybody can relax and just have a, a fun chatting time here today. And, and of course, if during the program uh, something has is coming up and you need to leave early, feel free. No worries about that. Uh, later on, this program will be recorded and archived and upload it to our YouTube channel so that you can access it from there. We also do have a PDF handout with some of the key points from today's presentation, as well as uh, resource links to uh, some of the books that we mentioned and you know uh, some of the books and the authors that we mentioned in today's program, a lot of which are owned by our library's catalog. So all of that will be in that PDF document which will be shared to everybody who registered to this program. All right, so this is celebrating the Nobel Prize in Literature. Uh, now, the Nobel Prize in Literature is, you know, the most prestigious, prestigious uh, literature prize out there. And it awards the person, not an individual uh, work. Uh, now, it started with a relatively humble beginning you know, from a uh, almost like an outskirt country in Europe. But then uh, by now, it really has gained the status of being the epitome uh, of the highest standards in literature in general. So there are lots of interesting things to talk about. Uh, and of course, just like anything else, there are also the kind of not so beautiful things about such a, uh, such a prize that we're going to talk about today. Now, uh, just in the chat box, if you guys want to start discussing, uh, what kind of Nobel Prize recipients have you read before? You know, just from America, we have Hemingway, we have Faulkner, we have Toni Morrison. Uh, so if you have read any books that you that really has impacted your life in the past, uh, feel free to share and discuss with your fellow attendees today. This program is going to take about, uh, I would say, maybe an, an hour and 15 minutes uh, for the presentation. And of course, there will be a time at the end for questions and discussions. All right. So the Nobel Prize is one of a five-part prize. Uh, it has uh, physics, chemistry, medicine, peace, and literature. Later on, they also added the sixth part, which is the uh, prize for econ uh, economic sciences. So far for the literature prize, there had been 119 individual uh, receiving the prize from 1901 to 2022. The most recent one was awarded just a couple of weeks ago. Out of the 119, there were only 17 uh, female laureates, unfortunately. But that was actually relatively high compared to the rest of the prizes. It's second only to the Peace Prize. The recipient of the prize would receive 10 million Swedish kroners. Uh, that's uh, equivalent to just short of a million US dollars, uh, about 890 US dollars. And it's a prize for the writer's life's work, not just specific literary achievements. What's very interesting about this is that uh, all of the process, uh, you know, from the nomination to the discussion between committee members uh, are going to be kept secret for 50 years. And after the 50 year period, then it will be released online into the archive. Uh, this is to ensure that anybody who is picking the prize during the current year 
will not be too much affected by the public opinion. Uh, and also the public opinion cannot, you know, in turn, actively pressure uh, the current committee members. On the right, we're going to we see this medal right here that's for the prize in literature. The front side is the profile of um, Alfred Nobel himself. And on the back, there is a relief of a young man being crowned by a muse. And on it is the Latin, even tus vitam itat eclusi per artis. Obviously, I can't speak Latin, so. Uh, but it means it is beneficial to have improved human life through discovered arts. And that really has captured a lot of what the Nobel Prize is trying to do. A few interesting facts here. Uh, the, even though this prize has been a largely male-centric in the past, there really has been a good trend uh, of new female laureates in the recent years. Ever since 1990, the ratio between male and female recipients have been uh, uh, become a lot closer to two to one. And in recent years, it's even one to one. Out of all languages, English is the one that's awarded the most often. There are more than 30 recipients who write primarily in English, followed by 15 in French, 15 in German, 11 in Spanish, and after that, there are also the other European countries, uh, European country languages, such as Swedish, Russian, Italian, and Polish. Usually this award does not, uh, is not given to any posthumous authors, with the only exception being in 1931 to Eric Karfeld, who was a member of the Swedish committee at the time. Now, how does it work? So every year, they're going to start uh, nomination pretty early. They send out an invitation back in September of the previous year. And by January, uh, those uh, literary professors, known critics, and also previous winners of the prize uh, have already submitted their, uh, their nominations to the committee. Then they're going to reduce that down to a short list, about 15 to 20 candidates, until finally it's reduced to just five. Now, out of the five, uh, here is where the most vigorous work starts with the Academy. Every member of the Academy will uh, read the entire life's work of those five candidates, not just their best known works, but from the very beginning of their career to their most recent works to get a firm grasp of what this author is coming from. You know, each author has their unique perspective on how or what the world should be. Uh, and this only by reading their life's work could this award about the lifetime achievement uh, be of any merit. And at the end of the reading period, the Academy members would discuss uh, and debate really. And finally, they announce it in October and they award the uh, prize to, their, to the recipient in December. Now, as you can see, just like any award that's chosen by a human being, uh, there are controversies. Uh, just some of the smaller ones uh, from recent and not so recent years. The most recent one may be Bob Dylan from 2016. I, I still have very heated debate with uh, uh, fellow staff members here at PPL, really, on whether or not Dylan should have won the prize uh, as a lyricist. Uh, my, my opinion has changed throughout the, the years as well. Now, Hertha Müller was a German author who was relatively little known outside of Europe. So that drew a lot of criticism about the prize being Eurocentric again. Johnson and Martinson, who shared a prize in 1974, uh, was especially uh, almost like a slap in the face because both of them were the Academy members. Uh, Academy members are the ones who choose the prize. So they basically gave the prize to themselves. Uh, and nowadays, they are not really all that well known. So um, they, they really, uh, you know, uh, play some favoritism back then. And then there's Winston Churchill, who, by the way, did not win the Peace Prize, but won the, um, the prize in literature. 
So how did all those start? You know, this prize was actually pretty prestigious ever since the very beginning. Alfred Nobel, uh, here's an anecdote. Uh, just a few years before his actual death, he read about his own death uh, in the newspaper. And the title goes, the merchant of death has met death himself. And Nobel thought, you know, is that really how he wants to be remembered? He was a well-known chemist. He was a scientist, but he was also an industrialist. You know, he was a merchant. And he was no, most well-known for his invention of the dynamite. And he sold those dynamites. So really, he was, um, you know, he was a weapon merchant. And he doesn't want that to be his legacy. He wants to be remembered for peace instead. For that reason, he left a will. And he wants all uh, most of his uh, inheritance to be divided into five equal parts. And the interest of which will be awarded to those who during the preceding year have conferred the greatest benefit to, mankind, to humankind. Now, that's a sensational story. Because it's so sensational, and because Nobel has such a huge sum of money, it immediately created uh, an international discourse about around the prize. Everybody was speculating, you know, uh, who's, who's going to be the first recipient of the award uh, right after Nobel's death and the revelation of his will. So it had that international scope uh, and that sensation since the very start. Uh, now, the will was approved in 1897, uh, and people were already aware of it for four whole years until 1901, which is when the first uh, award was given. The thing is, because Nobel's will is, uh, you know, he wants to be remembered for peace, that's the main reason, uh, the literature award was not really all that pure. Here's what Nobel has written in his will. The prize is to be given to the person who, in the field of literature, produced the most outstanding work in an idealistic direction. So what does he mean by idealistic? If you're questioning that, nobody knows. It was left vague, uh, probably not intentionally vague. It's, it's just a, you know bad phrasing. And Nobel's handwriting was not that, all that clear either. So there are even debates on what he even has written on a piece of paper. And as you're about to see, what the price, uh, what the committee has decided throughout the years is largely just due to different interpretations of the will. Basically, what does idealistic mean? I mentioned a few times the Swedish com uh, Academy. So let me explain a little bit of uh, what this is. It's founded by the Swedish king in 1786, and it has 18 member members who, are, uh, who come to be known as the 18, or their adeton. They consist of Swedish writers, linguists, literary scholars, historians, and one jurist, an expert in law. And the members are elected uh, for three-year terms. This committee uh, are, is the one that sends out all those invitations for, uh, you know, for nominations. And they are the ones who shorten down to a short list. Uh, and then once the committee member have selected the ones to be read, uh, those works are passed on to the rest of the Swedish Academy, who is going to read their life's work. So as you can see, because this prize is chosen by the Swedish Academy, the secretary of the Academy now holds this, uh, this power on not just the prize, but on the standard of literature itself. Since, Nobel, since no, the Nobel Prize has come to be uh, almost equivalent to the highest standard of literature. And that creates a problem because at the very beginning, of the history of the prize, 
the secretary of the academy uh, was one Carl David of Vicien. It's this guy on the uh, on the right. He was a conservative uh, in literary taste. Um, what his interpretation of idealism is the lofty and sound idealism. You know, oh nature, oh you know family. So uh, this ideal holds uh, religion, holds family sacred, and it just has that uh, not idealistic but almost idyllic way of living. His taste in art largely followed the Goethe and Hegel's aesthetic, and Hegel. Um, the German philosopher believes that art is just a phase uh, in human history. Eventually, art is going to dissolve and humans are going to move on to another phase. Uh, so because of that, art as it evolves itself uh, is also going to create hierarchies. So architecture, sculpture, those that have more physical forms, those are the lesser art, you know, uh, and then it moves on to paintings, the, the visual art, uh, perhaps they're, they're a little bit better. And finally, poetry. That's the, the pinnacle of art in the Hegelian view. This is not really all that close to what Nobel himself has believed in, because Nobel was one who really shunned away from high society, uh, and he had a lot, a lot of a, a more open taste in literature. Now, because of Vizian's uh, uh, Vizian's influence on the early days of the academy, a lot of the early recipients are of this lofty and sound idealism uh, kind of tradition. Sully Proudhon was a French poet who was the first recipient of the prize, actually. Uh, later on, he was relatively little known because really he was, he was not of the same caliber. Now, Bjornstern Bjornsson was a Sw uh, Swedish author who, who was pretty good. Uh, and then we have Rudyard Kipling, the author of uh, The Jungle Story, uh, and also some, some very good poems. But Kipling's view is still a lot more conservative uh, and really just, just Eurocentric. So with Vizian's influence, uh, with, with the prize given to some of the lesser candidates, we're missing some of the giants during that time. And we start with Leo Tolstoy, the author of War and Peace, of Anna Karelina, and the death of Ivan Ilyich. Now, it was, it was a huge scandal that Tolstoy was not the first recipient of the prize. He was not the second recipient. He was not the recipient ever. Tolstoy was actually uh, nominated, I believe, six, seven times for the Literature Prize. And he was nominated a few times for, uh, three times for the Peace Prize as well. But he was never selected. After the first prize was awarded to French poet Prudhomme, a lot of European authors actually got together and wrote a letter collectively and sent it to Tolstoy saying, oh, you know, you are our literary idol. Uh, we have always believed that you should be the first one uh, to receive this prize. And please do not be discouraged, uh, you know, <laughs> by this bad decision. And Tolstoy replied that he doesn't really need the money because he was already very rich. He was from the nobility class and he has donated a lot of his own belongings uh, to revolutionaries and social activists. So at least from the surface, Tolstoy doesn't seem to care. And he was not selected mostly because uh, Vizian himself doesn't really like Tolstoy's realism. Who else are missing from that time period? Oh. Well, here are a few names that you may recognize. We have uh, Rainer Rilke on the far left. Then we have Henrik Ibsen. We have Anton Chekhov, Mark Twain, Marcel Proust, Emile Zola, Henry James, Joseph Conrad. Now, 
a lot of those are some of the most impactful literary giants at the turn of the, the century, and none of them got the award. There are also some of the other literary giants who kind of self-excluded, such as Kafka, who famously wanted his friend to burn all of his uh, all of his fictional and non-fictional pieces at his death, which his friend fortunately did not oblige. The friend instead published them, and that's why we even know that there was a Kafka to begin with. But that was an oddity. You know, most of those writers were pretty well known at the time, and they and their their values, you know, their personal values really do not deviate from the uh, the spirit of the time uh, that far. It's just that in their writing, they seem to be more radical uh, to the the academy's taste. So after this initial period, there were a few transitional period. Firstly, during the first Great War, uh, the Academy wanted to award more neutrality so that they don't get involved in this European power play. So we have a lot of Scandinavian writers uh, who received the prize because they were neutral during the war. But of course, they also given to some of the other writers, uh, Tagore from British India and also Roland from France. After that, in the 20s, uh, there was a slight opening up uh, of what idealism may mean. And they uh, have given it to recipients such as Bernard Shaw and Thomas Mann, who are relatively uh, you know, uh, less close to the mainstream at the time. But they're also still awarding the great style, which is the classic style, you know, the Goethe, the Hegelian kind of style. In the 1930s, the Academy wanted to try uh, give the prize to popularity. You know, what are some of the authors who are who have a huge readership right now? Perhaps they're relevant uh, because of their popularity. So. Because of that, they have given a prize to people like Sinclair Lewis. That's the first American recipient. They gave it to Eugene O'Neill, American playwright, and also Pearl S. Buck, who we will talk about in more detail a little bit later. This transitional period was also hard to talk about because it, uh, it, it's the wartime, you know. So they have to skip a few years, notably 1914, 1918. 1935, and then also 1940 to 43 because of the wars. But now something is changing. There's a new secretary to the academy, and his name is Anders Austerling. We call it Austerling's Epoch because the epoch has lasted a lot longer than just his tenure as the secretary, which is from 1941 to 1964. Osterling's view was a lot more open, a lot wider than Vizian's. Uh, and because of that, he was very influential to future secretaries and even to uh, literary taste uh, in general after that. Under his leadership, the Academy started recognizing depth uh, even among pessimistic writers. You know, the, they start recognizing that there may be something great from radicalism, from people who are trying to experiment with the literature. So they have given a prize to people like Hermann Hesse, uh, a German writer. Uh, he's known for, I think, the Tindrum. Um, and then there are also authors like Samuel Beckett, who has written uh, Waiting for Godot. It's a, it's a really weird little play, if you have not heard about it. Uh, the entire play is about those two people waiting for a guy named Godot. Uh, and the guy never shows up. So this entire play is just about the two of them having a conversation. At the end of the play, or really during it, you can start to see some of the metaphorical values uh, in waiting for something that would never come. But something like this, you know, it's already pretty far from, from ideal. What, what does idealism even mean? Uh, if you are going to award it to such a such a play that doesn't seem to be talking about anything at the first glance. But Osterling 
recognize the value in such a work. Uh, the reason being that uh, Austerling was not just a poet himself, but he was also a translator. He was very prolific. Uh, he was uh, he has expertise in English and in uh, I believe German. So he translated people like T. S. Eliot, uh, Quasimodo, Hesse, Eugene O'Neill, Goethe, and Galsworthy. So that really has given them a really uh, diverse literary background. But not even that is enough to admit people like Ezra Pound. Ezra Pound was an influential poet at the beginning of the century. Uh, and he basically started the American modern poetry. Very influential to T.S. Eliot. And he was a mentor to a lot of uh, artists at the time too. But Pound uh, was also uh, a Nazi, basically. During the Second World War, he went to Germany and he was pretty vocal about his support to the Nazi party. And he was even arrested and uh, tried for treason, uh, which you know he, he got out of, he, he did live out of that. But uh, here's the line that the academy is going to draw, that even though they are awarding more pessimistic uh, and less quote unquote ideal authors, uh, they still don't want someone who's very vocal about uh, something like eugenics. So from here on, the Academy really started becoming the one that we are recognizing today, which is that they are awarding the prize to a lot of the pioneers. By pioneers, we mean that they are innovators of literature itself. They write avant-garde uh, new literary works that doesn't seem to be quite like a novel or quite like the poetry that we're used to. Uh, people like Eliot, uh, like William Faulkner, uh, like Samuel Beckett, some of those people we have already mentioned. But there are also pioneers in specific languages, namely languages outside of Europe and outside of North America uh, that has traditionally been overlooked by the Western canon. So we have people like Haldor Laxness, who writes in Icelandic. We have Yasunari uh, Kawabata, uh, who's from Japan. Isaac Bashevis Singer, who writes in Yiddish. We have uh, Nagib Mahfouz, who writes in Arabic. He's the uh, Egypt's only winner uh, of the Nobel Prize in Literature. We have Oran Pamuk, who writes in Turkish. And we have Gao Xinjian, who writes in Chinese. So now, because of the prize's effort, we are now seeing a lot of a global perspective. Uh, there's a lot of attention paid to linguistic uh, criteria, uh, but of course the focus is still on language, not their nationality. Because of this attention, there's an emergence of previous unknown masters that would have been missed uh, if literature is left to uh, you know, the free market itself, because people like to read the things that they're familiar with. Uh, but a, a huge task of literature is to introduce the unknown to the popular mass. So the award really has played a central role in discovering those masters out. On the left, we have Isaac uh, Bashevis Singer, who is an American uh, writer who writes mostly in Yiddish. Now, there were 11 million people who spoke the Yiddish language before the Second World War. By 1990, there were only 2 million people speaking it. And that was after a brief revival already. So the language was in decline because of human history, because of the human savageness. With each language, there is a unique perspective on the world. So by rescuing this language, you know, uh, Singer has really uh, allowed this perspective to still remain on this planet. And the Academy, by paying him attention, is helping him out by, uh, you know, continuing to strengthen the existence of this new perspective. And on the right side, we have Wolf Soinka, uh, who is a Nigerian author, uh, known mostly for his plays. 
uh, and he writes mostly in, in English, so it's not a, a language uh, criteria for him. But African voices have been largely forgotten, especially since the colonial period. And a lot of those authors are now emerging and start to tell their stories. And that's very valuable to us uh, as human race as a, as a whole. Soinka was very prolific. Uh, he's still writing right now. Uh, in fact, just last year in 2021, he published another novel at the age of 88. And it's called The Chronicles, uh, The Chronicles from the Land of the Happiest People on Earth. So if you have not heard about him, please check him out. Now the prize has become a funnel of discovery. There's a better balance between uh, universally celebrated writers and the unknown masters that we have been talking about. Here you may recognize some of those authors and you may not recognize some of the others. On the far left, we have Toni Morrison, who is one of my literary, literary heroes, really. Uh, beloved, the son of Solomon, uh, some of the just the most emotionally charged, uh, beautiful novels that you're ever going to read. And she's the first uh, African-American woman to win the prize. And he has really introduced that voice to international discourse. Second from the left, we have uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, probably one of the most well-known names in today's presentation. He's from Colombia, uh, one of the uh, faces to South American magic realism. He has written books such as The Hundred Years of Solitude, uh, and No One Writes to the Colonel, novels like that. Uh, in his books, uh, you're going to see this kind of perspective that's almost like a, uh, you know, like a South American grandmother's bedtime story, but it's mixed with the adult, more adult content. You know, you're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna see the blood, you're going to see the ugliness of uh, human society, but it's all told within this magical perspective. In the middle, we have Jose Saramago, who is from Portugal. Uh, from Portugal. He didn't get recognition as an author until he was 60. So he, you know, he just really held on with it and continued writing uh, until he finally got recognition uh, uh, at a senior age. And at the age of 76, he was awarded the prize. Writing as a Portuguese author is difficult because it's so close to Spanish and Portuguese itself is not a widely spoken language. So almost always, he will be immediately translated into Spanish. And all of the literary critics around the world are going to be discussing the Spanish version of his works. So it's, uh, you know, awarding him is really a, uh, you know, giving props to Portuguese as a language. And that's very important to them. Second to the right, we have Ginter Grass. Uh, Again, one of the most well-known German authors out there. And excuse me, yeah, he's the author of the Tindrum. I believe I uh, said that Husse was earlier. And on the far right, we have Canadian uh, Canadian author, Alice Moreau. He's known for his short stories. And you may have read a lot of his stories because we uh, our libraries have a huge collection of uh, Miss Moreau. So by now, the definition of idealism has largely changed. You know, ever since 1927, idealism, just the phrase itself, was only mentioned three times. And if you look at this chart on the right, before 1927, uh, it was mentioned over and over again uh, in the reason given to why this author was uh, awarded the prize. For the first winner, Proudhon, the reason was uh, that he, his poetry displayed this lofty idealism. And you can just see this, they were really fixated on this idealistic uh, phrase because they didn't want to deviate from Nobel's will. But since 1927, only three times was it mentioned. And after 1950, uh, after the award was given to Bertrand Russell, uh, it was 
never mentioned again uh, as a reason for the award. So it was not really forgotten, but the Academy has recognized that there is there's something else that's more important, the, the more practical idealism, something that's not really spoken, uh, not really displayed, uh, but just intrinsic to literature itself. Now, of course, they still want to promote a more positive and humanistic tendency. Uh, and because of that, uh, you know, they, they would reject people like Ezra Pound, obviously. But they would also kind of shy away from the pure artist, you know, the people who want to experiment art just for art's sake. Uh, and with that, we're about to see some of the, the giants who got omitted because of this reason. For instance, does this new standard apply to Bob Dylan? His reason for being awarded the prize was for having created new poetic expressions within the American song tradition. When it was announced in 2016 that Dylan is the, the new recipient, it really has created a storm on the internet uh, about why he should or should not have received this prize. People who support the decision think that, yeah, of course they should. This is just, you know, music, uh, folk songs, it's just a new storytelling form. In fact, it was not even that new. You know, he was, it was like a ballad. Uh, if ballads can be considered as poets by today's standard, then why not Dylan? He has those really long and intricate songs uh, that's, that explores complex themes. One critic calls it uh, Shakespearean, you know, that rude, warm blood. Because when Shakespeare wrote his plays, a lot of those languages were not accepted by high society. Uh, and a lot of those were playing to the taste of the popular mass. But Shakespearean language has created new language in the English tradition. People who are against this decision would, has some pretty good reasons as well. First of all, there are a lot more deserving candidates that exist. You know, uh, there are a lot of poets who were not never awarded the prize, and a lot of them are still living today. They also explore com complex themes. Uh, so, is Dylan receiving the receiving the prize just because uh, he's a musician? Is that some sort of affirmative action to him? Because, you know, ultimately it's. It's not even in the right category. Dylan was already so well rewarded in the musical industry that does he need to receive this literature award? It's like pinning a, a medal on Mount Everest, you know, saying, hey, here we go. We now recognize you as one of the best uh, in this other field. And it just doesn't make a lot of sense to people. For me, I was, for a long time, I was against Dylan winning the prize. Uh, but after a while, my opinion kind of softened, mostly because I, I just this once I read his lyrics, not in so, not in song form. You know, I, I didn't listen to it. I was just reading it, and reading the lyrics in silence uh, kind of shows that there is a different quality in them because you read them in different tempo, you assign them different tones, and there I kind of discovered that there is uh, there is something else. Uh, to those lyrics. Uh, for instance, The Murder Most Foul. The song itself was slow, was pretty tranquil. Uh, Dylan sings in his, you know, uh, in his twang. Uh, and it seems like the tune was the same from line to line. So it kind of goes into the cyclic dream. Now, of course, a lot of music critics will, uh, will definitely tell me, you know, why that is the perfect tune for the song. But reading the lyrics by itself, uh, without any music assigned to it, I see this anger. Uh, you know, uh, it was, sorry, I couldn't recite it. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think Kennedy, it's a song about Kennedy's assassination. And Kennedy says, you know, well, wait a minute, boys, do you know who I am? Of course we do, we know who you are. Then they blew off his head in the middle of the day. Uh, 
you know, it was it was just so cold and and snappy, uh, the kind of quality that you you will overlook if you're just listening to it as music. So maybe the academy had done a good job in uh, discovering a new artist, or perhaps discovering art in a new way that we have been ignoring uh, until now. But controversies are not just related to artistic tastes because there's also the politics. For example, because the prize is just so prestigious, uh, it's feeding a lot of nationalistic prize. If the recipient is coming from a European country or from a North American country, uh, you know, the English speaking world, basically, uh, it doesn't really create that, that many news. You know, it's just another recipient uh, to that nation. But if a nation who has never been awarded uh, before, who has never produced a Nobel laureate, then getting a Nobel Prize is a big deal. And it's going to be talked about. That laureate will become a, the, the center of discussions for a long, long time. And it's going the debate is going to get pretty heated. Now, of course, there is always the, uh, the criticism about the prize being too Eurocentric about it being too male-centric. A lot of those are, uh, you know, definitely legitimate criticisms. There is also criticism about the prize supporting the dissidents of certain countries. You know, hey, if, if you speak against your government, uh, then maybe you have a better chance of winning the prize. But is it always fair to judge someone's literary quality by their political stance, even though you're trying to support those uh, those lone wolves, basically. Not to mention that by awarding it to uh, distance in certain countries, it may also bring danger to them. So would, should that be considered? Now, the academy was found by the Swedish king, so that connection to the royalty is another complex issue. You know, uh, and European royalty is just too interconnected with colonialism, and now the world has not completely rid of colonialism impact just yet, that connection really make things a bit strange and uh, you know embarrassing to swallow for some people. Public perception is another big thing. Here we have Winston Churchill, who won the prize for his historical writing, for his memoirs. The Academy decided to give the prize to him uh, about 10 years after the war ended thinking, oh, surely, surely people would see this as a purely literary choice, you know, for Churchill's great writing long after he quit politics. But of course, people are not going to think like that. Uh, we still see him as one of the big three of the allies during the war. So this, this choice of Churchill is still seen as a political move, no matter uh, what solid reasons could be given by the academy. The Soviet choices are especially testy. This is what I was talking about in uh, awarding the prize to dissidents, because from there on, no matter what, uh, those recipients will be judged by their political stance and by their nationality as opposed to their literary quality. Even though the three authors right here listed, they have drastically different stances and views on the Soviet Union. On the left, we have Boris Pasternak, who is the author of Dr. Zhivago, and he was awarded in 1958. He was forced by the Soviet uh, government to refuse the prize, and that was that. Uh, now, the, this, the Academy does not recognize a refusal, so uh, they still list Pasternak as the recipient of that year. And then in the middle, we have Mikhail Sholokov, who was not opposed to the Soviet Union, but he has written some great, great novels that's definitely on the Nobel caliber. Uh, the great novel called And Quiet uh, Flows to Dawn is a novel about the Don Cossacks uh, of the Russians. So this is this tribal people uh, who are indigenous to the Siberians. Uh, and he just traced their, uh, their tribal history from the first Great War to the Russian Revolution to the Civil War. It's a great novel. And then on the far right, we have 
uh, Sol Zhendinsen, who was not widely recognized as one of the best authors in Russian language, but he was very adamant about his uh, opposition to the Soviet Union. Uh, and even in the awards uh, reasoning, it was uh, the, the reason cited was that he was a ethical force against you know oppression so you know his awarding really could be seen as something that's just supporting their political stance as opposed to literary quality now the how does the academy get out of this what the academy claims is that well sure political effects are unavoidable unavoidable no matter what, there are people who are going to feel the nationalistic pride. There are people who are going to be unhappy about a recipient uh, or someone not receiving it. But they can't be thinking about that all this time. They, what the academy can promise is that they won't have any political intention in awarding a certain prize to a certain person, uh, perfectly knowing that the political effect will be there regardless. They try to hold on to that political in integrity by claiming that there is no political intention. But if that's the case, then why are there so many unpopular figures? You know, not just from the Soviet Union, but say from uh, from the Middle East, uh, even from the, the the Western world. There are so many people who seems to be unpopular within their own societies. Does it mean that people who are outside of the mainstream Sometimes they have more to say, perhaps by being a rebel, a rebel, by, you know, rejecting the mainstream value, uh, their voices would deserve more spotlight and, and they would have more literary merit in them. So that's something that's that's very interesting to think about. Uh, and I really encourage all of us to think about this question uh, because it really touches on what's the purpose of literature is it to echo the mainstream voice uh, or to retell a piece of history? Or is it to try to find uh, faults in our current society and see what are the better ways to improve it? Or would that, by looking at the problems, would that actually increase uh, or and widen the problems? There's a lot of things to talk about here. Now, we have seen a evolution of the literary standard throughout the years. So now it's very interesting to go back and think about uh, some of the past denials. For instance, Tolstoy was not awarded the prize. So there's that debate between Prudhum and Tolstoy. Robert Frost, who is depicted on the right, is an American uh, poet, one of my favorite poets. And he was denied because of his old age. But then Doris Lessing was uh, awarded the prize at the age uh, of 88. That's even older than Robert Frost. We have William Maugham, who is a French novelist. Uh, he's known for his novel, uh, The Moon and the Sixpence, which is about this artist who escaped to a Pacific island and to pursue his artistic dream there. Then on the left, we have Pearl S. Buck, uh, who, uh, you know, she's a female writer. He lived in China for quite a few years. Uh, and she wrote about uh, the Chinese farmers as, she's, as she witnessed them. There's this novel called the, the Good Earth. Maybe you have heard about it. It's about this farmer family who discovered a treasure. They could have kept it, but eventually they gave it back. So, a, you know, a kind of a simplistic story. Uh, so Buck was really not a great author. You know, she was fairly good, but she was not great. Uh, then if popularity was a factor, then why Buck but not Mom? And then we have the pioneers such as James Joyce, who has written the great novel called Ulysses. It's just very experimental, very thick, very hard to read. Uh, but if he was omitted, then William Faulkner really got lucky there because Faulkner was not really all that well known before uh, he received the prize. 
But now, if we're going to compare past winners and past non winners, uh, here's a list of just a few great authors from each category. Uh, you may recognize quite a few names here. And you're going to see that perhaps there's not much of a difference in literary merit between the two. Among masters who has never won, there is George Orwell, the author of 1984. We have Virginia Woolf, who is very influential in the stream of consciousness writing style. Uh, we have Borges, we have Nabokov, uh, who are experimental in, in their writings and created those philosophical puzzles for readers to solve. Uh, and we have Chino Achebe, who is providing this African perspective that we have been uh, really paying a lot of attention to in recent years. But then on the other hand, uh, we can also think about it this way, which is that among the people on from the right category, they have been chosen from a much larger pool because you know the, the people who are not awarded the Nobel Prize consist of a lot more mediocre writers, a lot of unknown writers, a lot of bad writers. Uh, it's just that there are some hidden gems from there that didn't get to receive the prize and kind of, you know, didn't get this almost enshrinement status. And that's what bothers people. But if we're going to look at the list of just great authors, the Nobel Prize laureate list is still a very reliable list to look at because they have a much smaller pool of mediocre writers, and there really isn't a lot of bad writers on that list. Another big criticism about the Nobel Prize is that they always seem to catch the authors on their downward swing. Uh, here is a diagram on different prizes uh, and the age of their recipients. As you can see on the far left, that's the physics prize. And we have a lot of younger recipients uh, because science is a lot, to, uh, a lot easier to prove. You know, As soon as they pr produced a peer-researched paper and people have replicated their experiments, they can see, oh, hey, yeah, this person is onto something. And uh, you know, some previous theory was proved because of their work or uh, disproved because of their work and they can immediately start the awarding process. But then if we're going to look at the purple category, which is the second from the right, we see that a lot of those recipients are a lot older when they receive them. Uh, and their life's work are usually produced a little bit uh, before they actually receive the prize. And this is because great literature really needs time as their judge. Uh, just being on the bestseller list is not enough. They have to stand the test of time. They have to let people discuss them and see just what's their relevance and what's their impact on human society. So because of that, they have missed a lot of authors simply because they died. So what even is the point of awards after all? Is it just pinning a medal on Mount Everest? And also, if literature's purpose is to go against the mainstream, then getting recognized by the greatest prize uh, that we have, isn't that somehow you know, destroying that status as the dissident of mainstream? That's what uh, French philosopher Sartre was, thought, uh, was thinking about when he refused his prize. He was one of the only two people to refuse the prize. The other, the other one being Pasternak that we talked about earlier, who was forced by the uh, Soviet government to refuse. But Sartre refused on his own free will. He just doesn't want to receive any prize from any organization, thinking that this would tarnish, uh, you know, uh, basically his stance. And finally, that brings us to today. You know, the Academy has this awareness of setting the standard of literature itself since the very start. Hence that phrasing about idealism. And the Academy really couldn't escape, uh, you know, the views of their time. If the society was conservative around them, they have, 
the academy are just humans who came from that society, then of course they couldn't escape, escape that view. Uh, then this delay of uh, awarding the prize to certain authors kind of kind of allowed the society to change a bit, allowed allow us to gain a new perspective and both go back and review some of the great literature that we have missed. Or does it really change? Because here we have four authors uh, that doesn't seem to be all that different if we're just looking at them superficially. On the left, we have uh, the British Indian uh, poet Tagore. Uh, so, you know, that's early attention to uh, authors outside of Europe. Then we have Rudyard Kipling, who was among his great works, he was also known for, unfortunately, a poem called The White Man's Burden, which is about you know, him boasting about how, uh, you know, that the white race should take up responsibility for the rest of the world uh, by spreading civilization to, you know, the less fortunate. Then on the right side, uh, we do have, of course, progressive voices such as uh, Alexievich, that's the lady on the far right. Uh, she is from Belarus and she was part of the Soviet Union when it still existed. She excels in historical writing and uncovered a lot of the female voices as well as oppressed voices from uh, the Soviet times. And then we have people like V.S. Nepal, uh, who is really not a great person. You know, he's he's a great author, but he was uh, had a lot of, uh, you know, such as Islamophobia uh, views, a lot of misogynistic views. Uh, but then again, you know, authors are not great people. Authors are often terrible people. And, especially if we're going to judge them by the mainstream standard. It's just one of the ways for authors to make a living or to make their existence is by going against the mainstream. All right, now I'm going to start doing some library work. Uh, here on, let me drink a sip of water there. We have been talking a lot about literature about the price itself. Uh, but now I just want to do some reader's advisory. If you have been interested in the Nobel Prize recipient, or if you want to widen your scope and use the prize as a funnel of discovery, here I do have some authors that you can look into starting today. Here we have Orlan Pamuk, who is from Turkey, and he received the prize in 2006. He's a great novelist. Uh, the Black Book was one of his uh, first novels ever published. Uh, then we have The Museum of Innocence and The Red Hair Woman. Uh, I'm actually reading his uh, novel right now. It's called My Name is Red. It's a historical novel set in the end of 17th century in Istanbul. The story goes that um, you know, there are a lot of artists who are gathered by the great Sudan, and they're going to create a great book. So those artists are basically illustrators. Uh, they create those illustrations to go along with traditional folk tales, those well-known legends from the uh, Islam world. But from this book, uh, uh, sorry, excuse me, uh, there was a murder that was committed among one of those artists as they're creating this book, uh, people were thinking, oh, hey, is it some sort of blasphemy? You know, are we actually uh, going against uh, what our tradition has already been saying this entire time? So one of the great artists got assassinated. And that story, uh, this novel starts from there uh, and has a, a mystery element in it. It has some romantic element in it. It's just a, a great blast. You know, I have not been engrossed by a novel for such a long time. I feel like I'm doing a, a bad job at explaining it, but really it's because this, blue, this book has, has been blowing me away. Uh, and it's really hard to put, put it into word of what it is exactly. So I guess you just have to find out yourself. It's called My Name is Red. Here we have a poet from Chile 
his name is Pablo Naruda. He's known for a lot of his great love poems. And one of my favorites is called The Heights of Machu Picchu, which is this long uh, epic poem uh, paying tribute to the Machu Picchu uh, arch uh, archaic site. But you can see that he is really uh, using that as a metaphor for his country and for his uh, historic tradition. There's another poet from Chile. Uh, her name is uh, Mistral, M-I-S-T-R-A-L. Uh, and a lot of times she gets overlooked uh, because of Neruda, but I just want to give her a shout out. I've read uh, quite a few of her poems and she offers a unique perspective there as well. And she was known as one of the greatest poets in the Spanish language, along with Pablo Neruda. And Peter Hanke is the recipient from the 2019 uh, prize. He's an Austrian playwright. He writes in the German language. And some of his best known plays were written uh, when he was in his 20s. Offending the audience is very interesting. Uh, I, I read it and it's, it's really funny uh, even before the play starts because in his stage directions, he wants all of the audience to get into the theater uh, and there's going to be, you know, uh, the, the lights is going to dim in a certain way. Uh, and then the curtains are going to be drawn together. And he wants the stage hands to walk around the stage, you know, invisible to the audience right now and just kind of tap the curtain every now and then. And they're going to speak to each other as if they're moving things around, you know, giving directions to stage hands. Uh, so all of this is to create this anticipation of, oh, yeah, okay, we're sitting in the theater now and something great is about to happen. And now the curtain draws. And you see that the stage is entirely empty with no props, nothing, no characters. And now four players are going to walk from backstage towards the audience. And they're muttering something, you know, you couldn't really tell what they're saying. And as they get closer and closer, uh, of course, you can hear them better and better. And you realize, oh, wait, they're insulting the audience. You know, they're just saying all those dirty words and saying just how, you know, how stupid people are. Uh, and they just, <laughs> they just walk up to stage like that. And then the play starts. So very interesting way to, to start a play. And it would get you very uncomfortable, uh, but you, you would enjoy every moment of it. I went through three male authors. So now I just want to give some shout outs to some of the recent winners. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the Academy has been paying a lot more attention to giving the prize to female winners. On the far left, we have a Polish author, uh, Tokarczuk, who is known for writing those fragmented, uh, almost collage-like novels. And that collage, uh, so, you know, all of the chapters are really short and they come from different perspectives of different characters. And altogether, those fragmented chapters will form one story. And that kind of captures the, uh, the sense of Poland after the war, which is, you know, it's kind of between two worlds, between uh, Soviet and between the West. Uh, so where does Poland go, you know, that that kind of uh, uncertainty, that kind of uneasiness that uh, she has captured so well. Peter Hanka, we already went over. And here on the third one, we have a Gleek who is from America. Uh, she's very good at capturing a lot of the universal human themes, such as consolation uh, when facing death, such as aging, uh, you know, a loss of a great, uh, of a loved one. She has a poetry collection called The Faithful and Virtuous Night, which we own in the catalog. And it has 70 to 90 pages, I believe. Uh, and it uses long, soothing poetic lines. Uh, and they're so conversational and so comforting. And, uh, you know, just just really like, like someone who's sitting right in front of you, sharing their life's experience uh, when they're thinking about death or dreams. On the far right, we have last year's winner, Agorna, who writes about uh, Eastern Africa during the colonial period. 
So at the turn of the century, uh, turn of the 20th century, when the Germans first came over, when the British first came over and the scramble of Africa was at the height. So a lot of the Eastern Africans uh, who are who have been heavily influenced by the, the Islamic by the Islamic world until then are suddenly facing this this Western wall coming toward them. So he has been depicting a lot of the characters from that time and just what they're facing uh, when the world is, is you know, changing all around them. I read his novel called Paradise, which is it's uh, it's a coming of age story. It's very good. The language is pretty complex. So if you want to get into him, uh, take a deep breath and get prepared. Here are some of the notable writers who have not yet won the prize. Some of them you may recognize. Uh, for instance, the, the lady in the middle, uh, we have Margaret Atwood, the author of uh, A Maid's Tale. On the right, we have Murakami from Japan, who has written Norwegian Woods, uh, Kafka on the Shore, a lot of the uh, Japanese urban novels. On the left, top left, we have Adonis from Syria, who is a very experimental poet. And right below him, we have Milan Kundera, who has written the novel called uh, The Unbearable Lightness of Being. Bottom right, we have Ngugi uh, Wathion, uh, who's from Kenya. He was writing in English before, but uh, he switched back to his native language, a, you know, a much lesser known language so that he can, you know, just like what Singer did with Yiddish, he wants to promote his own uh, culture and linguistic tradition. So a lot of those authors may win in the future, or perhaps they would just pass away uh, before they get the chance. And finally, we have this year's winner, uh, Annie Ernaux. She's from France, uh, and she writes mostly in autobiographical writings. Her first novel was in autobiographical fiction. And since then, he kind of, she kind of just ditched the fictional part uh, and was just writing memoirs. Her memoirs are very honest. Uh, she doesn't shy away from uh, the unattractive part of being a human. Uh, and one of her best known works is called A Woman's Story. It was a New York Times notable book. According to Kirkus reviews, it was a deeply affectionate account of mothers and daughters youth and age, and dreams and reality. It's from Ernaud's perspective, but she was writing about her mother who had Alzheimer's and then later passed away. So just, just like how mothers would bring daughters to this world, uh, Ernaud wanted to bring her mother into the world now through writing. So this is just a very honest memoir uh, that have won a lot of the uh, attention and, and awards in the past. Here in our catalog, I think we have one book by her. It's called The Years. And it's a memoir that's written in the collective we pronoun. Uh, so not just writing from her own perspective, but from everybody from that same generation, really throughout generations. Uh, I would highly recommend checking it out. I haven't got a chance to read the book yet, but I did read a few excerpts and they're very interesting. Uh, a very gentle kind of language, crystal clear, uh, if you want to, uh, you know, uh, get into this very tender uh, view that's from a Nobel Prize recipient. All right, and finally, we do have other resources and library programs. Here at the library, we have in uh, some adult world language collections in different languages. Our biggest languages include Chinese, Spanish, and Hindi. Uh, but we have quite a few other languages as well. So please go to our catalog and take a look at what we have. If there's a book that we don't happen, that we don't happen to have in our catalog, you can also request it through interlibrary loan so we can look into other libraries throughout the country and see who, who wants to lend us a copy and give it to you. We do have a subscription to an academic database called EBSCO if you want to look more into the uh, academic literary analysis. Uh, and we do have a lot of programs related to literature and uh, creative writing. 
So in novel, uh, in November, we do have this write workshop series. If you're interested, if you're interested in in writing. Finally, we have uh, the NobelPrize.org website. You know, a lot of the information that I have here today uh, are drawn from this this website, which is the official site of the prize. They would give you quick facts. They would also have interviews and archived speeches, historical documents that you can take a look at if you're willing to explore more about the lore of the Nobel Prize. All right, and here is the page of citations. I'm going to leave it on the page uh, for a second so we get it recorded in the archive. And don't forget to listen to our podcast. Uh, Plano Library Speaks, and it's going to be very interesting. Uh, we have our own library staff members who are going to get on the podcast, as well as community partners. We have a lot of uh, news about you know upcoming programs and resources, and also just interesting perspectives from people who work in the field. All right, that is a lot of talking. Here, uh, if you guys have any questions and comments. Feel free to uh, feel free to tap uh, type them in the chat box. Otherwise, we will see you next time. And thank you very much for coming here today.